we always get on the roof with our friends. It's nice to be with you. Well, John, it's nice to be with you. And these are um, very different circumstances. We're in Tom yeah. again, but we're not in part of four. No, yes, normally our, our podcasts start with a, an introduction to, to part of four, but today yeah. we're in the... We're in the conference room of Clonard. It's a bigger space because not only as are we doing a podcast, but it's being videoed. It is. And it's going to be on the Clonard Facebook page. Do you dress up for the occasion? I dress down for the occasion, mm-hmm. yes. Well, I, was, I was expecting, as I came in, I said to you, I was expecting the frocks and the... the there is an old Pope's hat here, isn't there? There is, but I wouldn't be worthy to have it on my head. Okay. And we don't wear frocks in Clonard. What don't. do you What do you wear? Um, vestments. Vestments. Yeah. Vestments. Is that yeah. That's vestments the are habits. habits. Religious habits. Okay. But, uh, Why is the habit not on it? Because um, there's a strange thing about redemptive habits. They seem to shrink as the years go on. Oh. You know, and they just get tighter and tighter. Mm-hmm. So uh, mine is too tight at this stage. Okay, well, I'll not, I'll not say anything more. I, I, kinda, I dressed up for that occasion and thought I would wear something fancy. For those of you who are listening online, of course, this, this will all be uh, beyond you. But you can watch along on Facebook. It'll be on the Clonard Peace and Reconciliation. Uh, the the Clonard Peace and Reconciliation Facebook page is gone because it was oh. hacked oh. and it was being used along with my own personal one to try and scam people for money. So I've never put it back up again. Oh, I'll have to read. Uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll have to think it through again, but it was very difficult to get it shut down and to stop the scams, mm. but they are stopped now. Okay. So this, this will be on the main. On the Clonard Facebook page. Okay, great. So you can look forward to that. Um, it is one of those things a lot of people do tend when they're doing podcasts to video them as well yeah um, we haven't done that to date um, yeah. so then this is a new experience for us all it is a new experience for us all of course we have um, a genius in this uh, field uh, behind we the do. camera we do um, Father Mans from Indonesia but we're going to get him out from behind the camera a little we later are. and you'll be able to uh, hear him talk a little bit about yeah. himself yeah. and awesome about Indonesia person. yeah uh, which is good. So, uh, so this this is uh, series six where we're talking a little bit about prayer. Um, the, the last one we looked through our personal and private, um, then also our public prayer and how yeah. we dealt publicly with prayer. And interestingly, so Kieran, we're recording this on a Tuesday. Kieran came to us Sunday past there, uh, the, the middle of November, to us in Garnerville to take the service for us or take part in the service. And a couple of people on the way out said to me because you'd gone. Um, oh, it was nice to put a face to the, the, the voice, oh, so the a, a number of people yeah. who, who had listened obviously hadn't seen you um, before, so for those who are watching online, you'll be able to put faces to the voices. And, and see all the like. equipment we use. Yes, yes, and, and see what it's normally like. Um, but yeah, we're, we're talking about prayer, we're, we're this, and Father Man's going to come on a little bit and talk about um, something in relation to you, because you had mentioned last time, Kieran, that here in Clonard, in November, is the month to... The month to remember our beloved dead, but it's mm-hmm. not just in Clonard. Uh, this is something that's pretty common across the whole Catholic Church. Okay. In all, all in November? All in November. November okay. is the month for remembering the dead. So we begin the month with the Feast of All Saints in heaven and on earth. Mm-hmm. And then on the day after that, it's the Feast of All Souls. So when we remember those who have died. And here in Clonard, we have a kind of a shrine set up. Mm-hmm where people come and place their memorial cards. Now, I don't know if you know what a memorial card is. I feel like you talked about this last time, or maybe you just talked about it to me. I think just to you. So okay. uh, in the Catholic world, when somebody dies, um, a little card is prepared, though nowadays it can be even ready on the day of the funeral, which would have a photograph of the person, um, some details about when born, etc., mm. and some prayers on it, and that is given to all the mourners. But usually it's after but that's so people would have these memorial cards and they would bring them in and put them on this shrine in Clonard. Would they specifically have them for that reason to bring them in and put them on the shrine in Clonard or, or would this be more general people will do this regardless? Oh people will do this regardless okay. and it's because they do it regardless that they come in. Other people just bring in photographs okay. and place them there through, through the month mm. of November. So it is a month in which we remember our dead, we pray for our dead, we pray to our dead. And You're very that, specific I'm, about your words then. And I'm sure that raises all kinds of questions 
in a good Presbyterian mind like yours. Yeah, so that, that's all part of the podcast. So that's what we're exploring today as we listen, as, as we watch along as well. Um, and you told me off, so we'll get together occasionally and talk about what we're doing and uh, just generally have these conversations. And you told me off because I made a comment about praying for the dead, which is often the perspe- perception that Reformed people have, or Presbyterians, or maybe even others outside the Catholic tradition will have. Um, and you told me off, you said that it, it, it almost shocked you to the well, core. Well, actually, the, the, the one that shocked me to the core was you said, why do you pray to the dead? Uh-huh. Um, okay. so, so why why would that... So, so that's, uh, that's a use of language, and, and maybe that, that's poor on my behalf. That's just a kind of sweeping stereotype, yeah. you know, or just bad use of words on my behalf. But I would say there, there would be some who would go, well, what's wrong with that? Or, yeah. you, you said nothing wrong there. So, so explain to me, maybe then, or explain to us, why that why that would kind of catch for you. Yeah. Um, an awful lot depends on what you understand by people being dead. This is great. So because we're via video today, normally people who only listen long don't get to see the various smirks or the various <laughs> kind of looks. So this is great today. Because we're via video, we can see Kieran get uncomfortable uh, and um, smirk to himself when he talks about these things. But I've said to you privately, and I say it here now on the podcast, it really comes down to something that both of us both our, our traditions um, state on a Sunday mm. in the creed. We say, I believe or we believe in the communion of saints. Mm. And I think for me, that's the key to it. Um, so how do we in the Catholic tradition understand the communion of saints? We understand it like this. That the communion of saints consists of those of us here on earth. Man's over there and you and me and everybody else we know on this planet. Mm and those who are in the presence of God, however mysterious that presence is. So um, when people die, which is painful and full of grief and all of that, and they do depart, they leave leave an absence and we have to cope with the absence. But we believe that they have gone into the mystery of God and that in the mystery of God, they are alive in this new life that is promised. Now, we could get into Catholic theology of um, uh, particular judgment and uh, final judgment. We believe that when somebody dies, they go into the presence of God. Mm. The resurrection of the dead will come in God's time, but that they are in God's presence. So when we would pray, let's say, to someone who has left this world, we do so on on the basis of trusting that they are now in God's presence okay. and that um, they, along with all the saints, can um, pray for us here on earth. Um, we pray for the dead. Um, that's a more tricky one because it introduces a Catholic notion of purgatory, mm. which some members of your congregation, the very first time I went to the church, they wanted to know all about purgatory. Love it. Uh, what? Love it. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was a big kind of distinction, Reformation, yeah, wasn't it? It was a big distinction, then. the Reformation. In other words, purgatory is a, is a sense that when we die, um, we may not be ready for the intensity of the love that is heaven, that we may not have matured sufficiently. So it's some kind of growing up, maturing, um, getting ready for whatever that might mean. It's a theological construct uh, in that sense, that if we're not, if we haven't achieved the perfection that heaven requires, then there is some kind of purging of that which is imperfect in us so that we can go and be in heaven. But again, it's a theological idea. What it is, how it is, is something else entirely. Uh, is that the... So, can I just finish? Sure. So we pray for the dead in solidarity with them, that whatever this process is, that we are in solidarity with them so that they now are ready to go to God in heaven. Okay. Um, before I ask the question I was going to then, is, is a misunderstanding of that? So is a misunderstanding of what you've just described then the idea or the notion that by praying for them that in some way speeds up that process or helps that process or are we, are we going that again I'm glad this will be on video or is that going down to more kind of theological I think we're getting into, into concepts that are very difficult okay. because when people leave this world and go to God you're outside space and time mm. 
So you can't talk about time that you know speeds it up because there is no time. I think, I personally think that uh, purgatory is a recognition of how imperfect I have been in my life. And it could be instantaneous in that sense that I recognize what, where the imperfection is and it's healed and I'm ready now for God. It's uh, getting ready for God. Mm. How that does, I have no idea how that happens. Um, but we believe that there is some kind of getting ready for heaven and that we pray for our, our, our beloved dead that that may happen and that they are in the presence of God. That's mm. basically it. Okay. Has that changed? I remember one stage we were talking about this and has that changed since Vatican II or has that kind of the idea of purgatory or what you're describing there, has, has it changed over time or has, has it always been something that's been quite set in stone in some ways or is it, is it ever developing? Well it comes out of, uh, well first of all I'm not a dogmatic theologian so I, I honestly don't know the answer to your question. Um, I imagine uh, it's there since Vatican II. Its basis in scripture is in a book that um, for you is in the Apocrypha, for us is in the Bible and it's Maccabees. And at the end of Maccabees, um, where the uh, Jewish soldiers have gone out to fight the Greek um, oppressors, when they go out to collect the bodies of their slain uh, companions, mm -hmm. they find that they've been wearing talismans to other gods and they realize that they have to do something for this. So they pray for them so that they may um, participate in the resurrection of the dead. And I think maybe that's where uh, scripturally um, the idea that you pray for somebody so that they may be perfected to enter mm -hmm. into God's presence comes from. Um, I think in times past uh, people imaged purgatory, but again this is, uh, these are constructs, mm -hmm. nobody knows. Mm -hmm. They imaged purgatory um, like to purge something. Mm -hmm. um, you might use a refiner's fire, which is a language used in the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, so people talked about it as a fiery place, or so, but it's not a place. Um, it's just some transformation in the transformational process so that a person can be in heaven in the presence of God. Hmm. Thanks. I hope you're listening or watching. That's I hope big. somebody understood what I um, talked about. Well, uh, I'm not so <laughs> sure I understand it myself. <laughs> uh, I was just about to say, I hope that's clarified it in some way. Um, and, and again, we, we talk about this often, where these kind of constructs or these concepts are the, the best use of language to try and convey or help understand something that we ultimately don't understand. Well, uh, yesterday we had the pleasure of meeting a colleague of yours, um, uh, Dr. Stephen Even Williams, Williams. Mm -hmm. um, and he said something when we were having coffee yesterday that has stayed with me. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was taking different phrases from John Calvin, but if I recall it, he said, or at least Calvin would have said, that his thoughts cannot be adequately expressed in words, and his words cannot adequately express the mystery that is God. Now, mm -hmm. I may have been quoting him, uh, misquoting him. But I think around some of these concepts, thoughts, words, the mystery of God, the limitations of our thoughts and words to express something that is beyond us is what happens when we get into some of these theological concepts. Yeah, and that's an important part to remember because when we start to hang our opinions or when we start to put heavy weight behind these opinions, sometimes that can be detrimental because ultimately they are understandings that can be changed or developed over time. Yeah. Um, and I'm saying that because even, well, C.S. Lewis does the same thing. So C.S. Lewis, kind of from East Belfast, well known for the, the Narnia books and so all of those and kind of re reformed or Anglican apologists in, in the 20th century, so kind of well known in Protestant circles. Um, wrote a book called Great Divorce, which is essentially his journey in his mind's eye through purgatory. Mm -hmm. And so various characters, they get on this bus and go through purgatory or, or go through that stage of before ultimately reaching what they see as God's presence on the top of a mountain. It's his journey on the way and they discover things about themselves and other people along that way. And so that's almost in a sense, he's trying to convey in words that same idea of what happens between ultimately us passing from a physical presence 
here on earth into the presence of God itself and he's in a way doing what we've described and theologians have tried to do for centuries and ultimately what reformers decided to do in that because Maccabees wasn't part of our canon of scripture there was nowhere else they could find this mm. kind of authority or, or this kind of interpretation so their notion of it was very different and so we don't have the same prayers we don't have the same understanding um, ultimately it, ha- it hangs on kind of our idea of justification and how we can go into the presence of God uh, justified in, in that moment but equally then what I've discovered is that we don't use any kind of picture language we don't use any language we tend to avoid uh, what happens when we leave this physical earthly flesh and being and go into the presence of God there, there's just a kind of void and so what happens in that time what happens around that time for us as uh, a reformed tradition and, and others outside the Catholic tradition can sometimes be lacking um, you know and yeah. I, I've said to you often and even just experience it since my own father's passing you know just over a year ago the Catholic tradition deals much better with grief and deals much better with what happens after death on this earth much much better than the reformed tradition does we're kind of very light on that and very uh, very poor on that um, and so the idea of praying with or praying for or praying along is an interesting concept when it starts to become very personal Indeed, some years ago a very close friend of mine died and it was the first time that I ever had to, well it wasn't the first time, it was the second time with my mother I suppose, but it was the second time that I ever had to take the Catholic liturgy from the time a person died, from the place they died, through to their burial in the ground. Mm. And it, it is actually a very beautiful liturgy because it's, there are a whole series of steps along the way when the person dies, transfer to the um, funeral home, transfer to the church, the evening before the funeral, the, the requiem mass on the day, transfer to the grave and burial. And the liturgy says over and over and over again, this person has died. Um, you can't escape it, it just is repeated all over the time. It, it is just getting you to accept the fact this person has died but is destined for resurrection, is destined for resurrection. So we pray for this person that their sins may be forgiven and that they may enter into uh, the paradise, paradise uh, of God. And it's repeated all the way through, all the way through. There's the hope of the resurrection, there's prayer for forgiveness of sin of a person who has died. And it really confronts you with the two realities, the reality that this person's life is over, they have left, there's a vacuum, there is grief, but this person is destined for God and we pray for this person as they start their journey. Mm. Many, many years ago, a friend of mine was ordained and um, he went to the United States uh, the summer after his ordination and he was helping out in a, an American parish in, in, in New York and um, he was assigned a funeral. So he prepared it, he prepared the liturgy, he prepared the homilies, he prepared everything, he did the liturgy. And about three days later, the parish priest called him in to say there had been a complaint from the family yeah. about the way he had done this. And he was taken aback and he said, why, what, what did I do wrong? And the parish priest said, you kept on saying that the person was dead. And he said, but he was. Ah, yeah, but we don't say that. The Catholic liturgy says it over and over again. It confronts you with the reality, but it confronts you with another reality mm. that this person is going into the presence of God. And we pray that the sins may be forgiven, they may be perfected, and are in God's presence. Mm. So it's, 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 it's a very rich liturgy. Yeah. It's celebrated right across. Mm. Yeah, and I would say the, the Reformed tradition does the same, and that it celebrates, we tend to avoid probably praying for the person directly we would pray more for comfort and grief and uh, uh, those people who are here in front of you and uh, people often yeah, don't don't mind the fact that you you're saying or the, the person has died in front of you um, but there is a, a richness and warmth in the liturgy as you go through it um, and so now that that leads us on where we were going to talk about kind of how we approach 
that process mm. and how we approach the kind of the liturgy around that. Uh, and before we do that, so that's a kind of that's a, that's more personal, down to earth way. You talked at the start about the communion of saints, uh, and maybe again the Catholic tradition has a, a richer, richer uh, view on the whole communion of saints. I think we do it. We say it in the creed. I'm not sure how deep our understanding is of that. One of the things you also do in, in the Catholic tradition is, and we, we joke, we have joked about it often. So yesterday when we went went to, to meet Stephen Williams, as we're driving around, trying to find a car parking space, you go, <laughs> oh, you should pray to, or is that even, pray to, pray Saint Peter, Saint Peter, uh, and there we go. There's a car parking space. Immediately, you you said you'd lost your phone this morning, and you prayed to Saint Anthony, and I found my phone. There you go. Um, so not only is it you're praying with or for individuals in the state after they leave the have to be very careful with words here no, you, just say so it. so after they've left you you pray for individuals family members friends etc etc but there are also then saints who have specific roles well i was thinking about that since our conversation yesterday i just wondered did the whole thing of these saints start off in a context where in the Greek and Roman world, people would have had their household gods, mm. you know, and they would have household gods that they would pray to for particular things, and that that um, transformed itself into um, patron saints praying for different things. Again, it comes back to, for instance, what maybe something that was in that saint's life, or something that they were they were uh, like St. Francis and the poor. Well, you'd pray to St. Francis for the poor. You'd pray for the poor and ask him to pray with you for the poor. Or um, St. Blaise. You don't know about St. Blaise. <laughs> you don't know. Unless he's got to do with golf balls. Uh, no, no, it's got to do with um, infections in your throat. Okay. So St. Blaise was a saint way back in Italy at some stage in the early centuries of the church. And he was condemned. He was a bishop and he was condemned. And he was being taken away to um, be executed. And as he was being taken away, this woman came to him. He was believed to be a holy man. Her child had a fishbone caught in its throat. Now, Blaise was also a physician before he was a bishop. And he got the fishbone out. It was as simple as that. Nothing miraculous. He got the fishbone out. But after his martyrdom, he became the patron saint of those who have any ailments in the throat. Yeah. So you pray to that's because that happened in his life. Uh -huh. So okay. it usually has to do, like today, as we make this uh, podcast, is November 22, which is the feast of Saint um, Cecilia. And Cecilia was a musician. Okay. Um, so she is now the patron, in her life, she was a martyr, but she is patron saint of musicians. So, in other words, if you're praying for musicians, you'd ask Cecilia to pray with you. Okay. So that's how um, the practice came up, that saints are associated with different things. Okay, and, uh, and so it's, it's always something they've done during their lifetime? Or something that or, or it, could do, uh, it could do with um, the manner of their dying or their martyrdom okay. or something like that. Is, is there a Saint Giron? There is a Saint Chiron of Clonmac Noise. Um, uh, I can't give you his dates. It's post Saint Patrick, but he was um, he was a, a, an abbot of a, a monastery, Clonmac Noise, on the banks of the Shannon, um, and his monastery was a place of learning. I have no idea what he's a patron saint of. Okay, so, so there there are a, a small specific number with specific rules. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then, any other examples? Just, just a well, some examples can get uh, lost in translation. Okay. For instance, Saint Lawrence. Saint Lawrence was a deacon in Rome in the early centuries, and um, he was secretary to whoever was the pope at the time. Anyway, the man who was pope um, was uh, martyred, and soon afterwards, Lawrence was arrested, and the the, the Roman authorities wanted all the whatever money and valuables the church at that stage had so he was ordered to go away and to get the church's valuables and bring them back in three days so he was in charge of the money of the church at that so he got rid of it all gave it all off to the poor and on the day he went back then to the to the governor he brought in all of rome's poor and said here are the church's treasures okay uh -huh. so he was condemned to death 
and factually he was beheaded. Mm. Now, when people were martyred in Rome, they used to write in, 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 in Latin, passus est, P-A-S-S-U-S, -S est, he suffered, or passa est in the case of a, a, a woman. So this was written in the record, passus est, but somewhere along the way, in the documentation, that initial P got um, worn and it was left as Asus Est. He mm. was roasted. Oh. So um, his symbol is a gridiron and a whole legend grew up that he was roasted oh. on um, a, a gridiron. So he's patron saint of barbecues and of chefs. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. So they'll pray to him for a good, good cooking or yeah. whatever. Okay. Even though he wasn't roasted. <laughs> Interesting. So you could all these. So, what happens in this? This may be a trite question. What happens if you pray to some of these and nothing happens? Or is that, is that they're just having an off day? Or well, that can happen. But I mean, people can pray to God for things, and there doesn't seem to be an answer to the mm. prayer. I mean, that's part of the. Isn't that part of praying? Um, I mean. I will meet people um, in the course of my life where they're devastated that they're praying for something and praying for something, particularly if it's an impossible situation that they find themselves in, mm. and there doesn't seem to be a ready answer. Um, how do we deal with that mystery? Um, we tend to say, oh, well, maybe God does answer our prayers, but not in the way that we expect, and that some, is the prayer is being answered in another way, not in the way that you had hoped or expected. So I think it's the same thing if you okay. ask a saint or invoke a saint's prayer. That, that's good. You've, you've taken my very unserious question now and moved it into a serious <laughs> country. In terms of, it's good to know that because sometimes when, certainly when I would hear of people praying for something or objects or car parking places, it, it kind of can become a little bit, it, it can feel jovial or it can feel oh well, this is going to work every time so the fact that you're saying that is even good and that's it's that they aren't to be used in that way and, they're, and they're I, not I've, magic moments I, I've been on a, on a golf course with um, someone before and, and heard them who's one for lost objects say Anthony Anthony um, who you know kind of joked about saying a prayer to St Anthony, Anthony for his golf ball and it, it's almost that when, when that starts to get in then you just assume that's the way in which a lot of these things are used so it's good to know that people in the same way aren't just praying those prayers for the sake of getting a car parking space or finding a golf ball they, there are lots of them that are very honest and deep and heartfelt prayers like Hannah and yeah. you know, the Bible and, and others who uh, go to God or go to these saints with serious grievances or ser serious uh, concerns or situations in them. Um, will we talk about the greatest saint of all? Greatest or, or saint is, of all is, in the Catholic tradition is anyway, it's Mary. Uh, but we've had Mary, we talked about Mary some series ago. Yeah, again I think this is maybe something that people in the Reformed tradition look at Catholics and think, gosh, they've turned her into a goddess. Um, she seems to be higher in the hierarchy than Jesus himself. Mary is the greatest of the saints. She's a creature just like you and me. Um, she's not a goddess. She's not a divine being. She's not in the Trinity. Um, but she is the greatest of the saints. And that's so when Vatican II met uh, way back in the 60s, there was pressure from the right wing of the church to have a document exclusively on Mary. Um, and the bishops decided, no, we're not doing that. We will have a section in the document on the church for Mary, and Mary is in there uh, in the section dealing with saints. She's the greatest of the saints. Mm. So this, this, this arose for us yesterday, for those watching and listening. When we were talking with Stephen Williams yesterday, at least when we were driving to talk with Stephen Williams, one of the questions you asked me is, well, with all this invocation of saints and invocation of Mary, what does that mean for the role that we know is Jesus' role, ongoing role, that he intercedes for us? Is this some kind of system to bypass that or to downgrade that? And it's not. Um, so when we ask somebody to pray, we're asking them to pray with us, um, to intercede for us. But the ultimate intercessor is Jesus Christ. 
And I said to you, for instance, you might ask me to pray, will you pray for, and people will say in Clon, will you pray for this, will you pray for that. It's not that we are bypassing Jesus. We are in some way uniting our prayer to his prayer of mm -hmm. intercession. Um, yeah, and that, that might be the best way to look at it for people trying to, trying to understand or to help understand because of your view of the communion and saints in that way and because they are still alive in the presence mm -hmm. of God. In a sense, you're asking them to pray with you for a scenario or, or pray with and you just, for and, something. And the understanding, I think, theologically would be we're asking them to join their prayer with that of Christ. Mm -hmm. Uh, to unite their prayer to, because he is the ultimate intercessor. An interesting point, and we can come back to it, I think we are going to come back to it with Stephen Williams, is the whole role of Christ's intercessory mm. uh, prayer. Mm. Um, we both acknowledge that it's not something that we usually think about. We, we tend to think that Christ's work is done um, uh, after the ascension, but that it continues, um, and it continues in terms of intercession for us. But we're going to explore that again. Yeah, but and that's, yeah, as you said, that's something that we will explore, because we, we do it, we just skip out the other scenes. Yeah. You know, so we, we'll have the same thing, we'll, we'll have specific prayers that we'll go to Jesus with, and they can all be as minor, or so it's, it's not as if we have a very high view in our theology of Jesus' intercession, we do this even just we don't go to various saints for that. We go directly to Jesus and Jesus said, we'll think about that, that kind of his intercessory role. Kind of I sometimes person. think of the, the, the communion of saints as a kind of a choir or a chorus mm. um, that are singing this prayer and that an individual such as myself in the choir might on a particular day be full of doubt. Um, mm. The choir sings. And the prayer continues, even though my voice might be a voice of a doubter, or maybe someone else is in grief and they're just not able to pray. The prayer of the chorus of saints continues mm -hmm. and carries them with, so that it's kind of one for all and all for one um, in the communion of saints. And if you've heard Kieran sing, well, that's a nice picture for us. <laughs> ah, well, do you know what? Since you are going to be teasing me, I am a saint for you oh? when you go golfing. Okay. Saint Jude. You pray okay. to Saint Jude when you go golfing, and every Catholic out there will know exactly what I mean. Right. What, what does Saint Jude help me with? Uh, the patron saint of hopeless causes. Oh, very good. Very good. Thanks. Thanks. He'll help me in my hopeless cause. <laughs> um, appreciate that. Uh, yeah. You can try that next Saturday, I'm saying golf, I'll have to send you it for me, uh, and he'll help me in my hopeless cause. Um, that's good. What we always suggest coming off the back of these, if you have any questions, so if you're a listener, you send an email to... Presbyterianandpriest at gmail.com. Okay, and if you're watching us online through this video, you can leave a comment or send a message to the Facebook page, and, uh, and we'll be happy to, to answer those questions, because... As we're saying, we are doing our best in this conversation to try and think through lots of these things. But equally, you, as you listen, we'll have your own questions and have your own uh, uh, kind of parts of that that you want maybe expanded a little bit. And we will come back to touch, and we have touched on on various. So we might just direct you uh, to some of those episodes. Just to finish, because we have a few minutes left, we're going to get Mans in because we want him to talk a little bit and about about Indonesia. Uh, about Indonesia and how they approach. So. Whenever, as a prelude to that, you mentioned earlier about your liturgy um, through times of grief, grief and death. Our liturgy might be different, but our approach in terms of funerals within Northern Ireland are quite similar in terms of the steps and stages we go through uh, and guided by you know, funeral directors and all those around us. So we want to get Mads to come and talk a little bit about what it's like um, how oh, around the time of death in Indonesia. In, in Indonesia and what that might look like, including some liturgy, uh, including um, yeah, the, the various traditions that are uh, around that. Well, while Mans is coming over to his chair, uh, could I say Mans has been a member of the community here in Clarence for the last two years, a very valued member of our community, and we will miss him when he goes in December. Um, he has a reputation for being a very good preacher on topics that people uh, find relevant. Great. Um, so we're, we're delighted that Mans can be with us, uh, particularly on this topic, to tell us a little bit about how uh, death is looked at and celebrated in Indonesia. But Johnny, you can ask the questions.
Okay. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you've come from Indonesia, you, you've been here for a couple of years now, and you were just saying beforehand, you're leaving here to go back to Indonesia in December and then on to Australia yes. um, in the new year. So you, you've been a big part of the community here, and we got to know you a little bit. So um, take, take us through, we've talked a little bit about the approach to, to death or surrounding death um, at t those times of grief. What would happen in Indonesia? Is it, is it similar to here or is it very different? Uh, yeah, so uh, first thank you for having me here, Johnny and Kiran. Uh, it's the first time, it's really privilege for me to be here as well. And yes, like uh, Kiran said that I come from Indonesia and actually uh, Indonesia is very big countries okay. and like uh, there are a lot of islands as well, more than 15,000 oh, wow. <laughs> islands wow. in Indonesia. So, and different islands uh, have their own uh, culture, okay. uh, especially around funeral as well. Right. So, but as a random tourist, I experienced a lot uh, 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 with the funeral rites in one of the islands okay. called Sumba. And Sumba is the island where one of our uh, member here in, in, here in Kronat, Father Owen. Okay. He comes from Indonesia, from that island. Oh, yeah. So, and, and, and when you say island, like how, yes. how big is it? Is it a big island or there thousands of people live on it yes. or only a few hundred? Or? Yeah, this is, there are like a six or a seven big island that okay. maybe f can be six, seven times bigger than okay. island. Okay. Yeah, uh, and there are still small islands as well. Right, yeah. right. So, yeah, so, uh, I experienced, uh, it came to me as a cultural shock as well when I went to Sumba, one of the island uh, there, like, like I said, uh, where our father Owen, one of the Clonard members here, uh, comes from. Mm -hmm. So they have a very, very different uh, kind of uh, uh, funeral that I can say that they celebrate death. Right. Yesterday I mentioned that to Kiran as well, that um, during the funeral people dance, traditional dance, they play traditional music. Right. Uh, there is still the feeling like the, there is sadness there, mm. but also joy. You can, you can, you can see the, the joy because people, uh, they, there is a party, so they, they kill animals, they have party, they eat and they right. dance and they play traditional music as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, so actually, I also uh, have experience of like asking people from local people, why is that? Because I am from Flores, different island in Indonesia, okay. and Flores is so much Christianized already. So okay. the funeral is quite similar to here. Okay. But in Sumba is different. So like I said, they come to me as a cultural so. Mm. So uh, and also uh, last year in in, in my uh, anthropology study here in Queen's University, we also talk about different uh, uh, funeral rites, and we talk a little bit about Sumba because Sumba is also kind of like a, a track to the uh, anthropologists even from Europe as okay. well. Okay. So they discuss about these things and actually related to the way they uh, understand about. God and about where people go after their death. Okay. Maybe that is the introduction and you can... <laughs> okay, okay. So, give us then some of the reasons they might approach it in that way. You know, why, why over here it's quite a somber occasion, you know, there, there's the focus around grief and loss. With ultimately, as Kieran was saying in that liturgy, the understanding that they're going on into the presence of God. So, what, why, why party? Yes. Uh, just you know, it seems strange that, that you would hold a part in that occasion too. That's very interesting question. So uh, for Sumbanese, uh, God for them is someone unknown. So they don't have any particular name for God. They they use a phrase like someone whose name cannot be mentioned, something okay. like that. When people interact to God is through the the soul or the spirit okay. of the ancestors, those who, who died. Mm -hmm. So actually the ancestors, th those people who have died, play important role in the life of the living. Okay. For example, if there is a, a, a natural disaster happen, and then they, they will think that our ancestors are angry to us, mm -hmm. and we have to do something. So like in Sumbanese culture, they kind of sacrifice animals, like a slaughter animal, in order to please ancestors. Okay. 
so actually like I, I'm talking about the natural disaster the natural disaster they believe comes from God mm -hmm. but these ancestors they have the uh, the power to, to stop or mm -hmm. to, to protect the mm -hmm. living yeah mm -hmm. so because of this important role when people died they believe that they will become a part of this community of the ancestors mm -hmm. who, who play important role mm -hmm. so kind of like there is upgrade they're going to yeah. the higher mm -hmm. uh, community yeah. that's why the sadness is there but they believe that oh they will go there and they will our protector Okay. Kind of like, uh, yeah. So could I ask, sir, 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 could yes. I ask, man, the day that you're talking about on, on that island, would they necessarily be Christians, or is this the more kind of um, um, religion of that island? Yes. Yeah, so this is a traditional religion. So uh, there is no connection with Christianity, mm. but almost 100% Sumbanese, they are all Christian. Uh, either Catholic or Protestant, mm -hmm. but they still keep their own traditional belief as well. Mm -hmm. So, like in uh, Redemptorist, we have our um, mission, Paris mission. We go around from Paris to Paris to preach mission. Mm -hmm. And for those who are still, uh, so I forget to mention that the name of this this tradition or this religion is Marapu. Mm -hmm. Ma means uh, uh, Maro means far. Apu is grand grandparents. So oh, okay. our grandparents was far, who, who are far away, mm -hmm. yeah. So there are still many people uh, uh, a part of this traditional religion and 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 uh, still not converted or don't, uh, still not uh, join the Christianity. Mm -hmm. And in in some of our mission, we try to preach the gospel and ask them to join. Mm -hmm. And while saying to them that you you can join us, but you still can keep uh, this tradition as well. Yeah, well that was going to be my next question actually. So you'd said that on one of the other islands, which was much more Christianized, the service was very different. Is there an element then when people, if, if and when they get converted, they come in, they, they lose part of that joy around or they change their traditions around the time of a funeral or time of death or do, do they tend to keep a, a, a little bit of their own tradition? Yeah, so I, I think in terms of like a traditional uh, belief uh, between the islands in Indonesia also very different from one island to another. Okay. So I believe that in, in Flores Island where I come from, mm -hmm. uh, even the traditional belief of death also is like a more uh, sad uh, uh, okay. and also like a time for grieving and mourning mm -hmm. so very different from uh, the one in Sumba Island mm -hmm. so uh, like in Sumba Island even when they become Christian they still keep that tradition yeah. in mm -hmm. Flores mm -hmm. also because now like uh, uh, also they they've been Christianized as well almost 100 percent uh, people in, in Flores are Catholic mm -hmm. but yeah the funeral just like before so I, I presume that not really different from the traditional one before mm -hmm. that I don't really have no idea even mm -hmm. though I come from Flores yeah. I know the traditional funeral in Zumba more better okay. than and, Flores. And so when you go to Zumba and take part in that do you take part in, in all those traditions like do you feel a sense of joy or do you feel a sense of you know I, I'm not going to ask if you dance but you know <laughs> it, it, do you get carried in that tradition? Yes, uh, so the, f the first time of course I, I found it quite difficult, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. no, this is the time that we should do yes, the strings. Yeah. How can I uh, dance or sing a song or play music mm -hmm. while the death body is still there and, and I know that mm -hmm. person who died. Yeah. But uh, the more I involve in that kind of uh, rituals mm -hmm. and Finally, I get used to it actually. Yeah, mm. yeah, and I was asking that because it's funny how our, our traditions can shape our grief in some ways. So, um, I, I, have a, I have a friend whose wife died when she was quite young, and I always remember him talking about you know if, if he would ever go to a, a Christian funeral, he would never enjoy them because they were so somber and sad. Whereas he said a lot of non-Christian funerals were much happier because they were celebrating a person's life. And in some way, Kieran, you were saying about how you, when we when we end this life here on earth we go into the presence of god and in some ways we should be dancing and be mm, happy because yes, you know yes. we're entering into something that makes us more whole and closer and better in the presence of god so there should be you know that kind of joy and celebration and dancing appeals to me in one sense
but I would never be able to do it here because in my <laughs> tradition people would think you're you you lost the plot in some way because or if you were disrespectful. Up or being disrespectful that you're kind of you know having the crack as they would say down south you know in the midst of someone's passing on but in some way there are like this tradition things to be yes, celebrated yes. because you're joining that choir or communion of saints in the bigger scale um, so maybe we should take a lesson from yeah, yeah, that's that's about, uh, yes. so how do you find then so being here in Clonard and I assume you've been involved in some way in, in various funerals have you found it strange coming into this context and this culture in what they've done or because of your own background and florists it's similar yes actually I don't really find like a big difference because like uh, Kira know by my background that I spent uh, quite a time in Australia in okay. New Zealand, yeah. so kind of like funeral in Australia and New Zealand is very similar to here. Okay. Yeah. But one thing that uh, I noticed that, uh, like, as someone from Indonesia, we so like Sumba is a kind of like a, a different case, but most part of Indonesia or the, the Eastern world, we usually provide time or uh, for grieving. So during the funeral, we cry. Like mm -hmm. even in in Flores, uh, when someone die, people cry while telling the story about pe this person's life when he was still mm -hmm. alive. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a storytelling while crying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And yeah. here, people they saw that they are sad, but mm -hmm. not not ask like uh, so that not easily notice. Yeah, yeah, we're not as emotion outwardly emotional in this country as we, we try to kind of keep it together and cry or show those emotions in private rather than doing it in public. Um, the the wake is a big part of Catholic tradition. Yeah, more in the in, in in the rural Catholic. Uh, okay, uh, would, would that be the same in the island you're talking about? So from the you know the moment someone dies, people would gather the community would gather around them and spend time with them and. It's, would that be, would that be yes, similar? Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I don't think we do that as much in, in Reformed traditions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's changing even in the Catholic world. Um, a lot of people have to die, go to the funeral home and not stay in their mm -hmm. own home. And people like, when my father died, it was to the funeral home. Um, and uh, people would gather there. And I suppose that's where they would tell stories. Um, there was tea, coffee. Um, they sit around and they chat, and then we would have the custom of a month's mind, mm -hmm. where uh, a month after a person died, you would gather again to pray, and people might talk, and you know the stories tell the stories, yeah. and then every year on the anniversary, now not that people might gather, but maybe immediate family members might gather. I do with my family for my mother and father on their anniversaries, which occur mm -hmm. in the same week, calendar week. Um, and we would tell stories and laugh and ah, there'd be tears too, but um, yeah. that, that's the way we, and I think a lot of people do that with mm. the anniversaries, you know. Yeah, yeah. Man, it's been a pleasure having you on. Um, thank you so we may much. We'll get you back at some stage again and answer some more of our questions. Um, and thank you to Man for all of this. The fact that you're getting to see us, if you're watching us uh, on the Facebook page, is because of Man. and so a huge thank you to Man for that. If you are listening to us, We'll encourage you to go to the Facebook page. Yes, you absolutely. Can, you can follow along or look, see a little bit about that. Um, but man, thank you again usually for yeah. what you've done for us today and what you've done for everyone watching along. And we hope you've enjoyed it. And, and grace and peace grace to you all. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. Grace and peace.